like swatting mosquitoes in a Tennessee summer, I could be swatting away fitness related myths all day long. So I'm going to do exactly that today. I have a giant list of some fitness and bodybuilding related myths, and we're gonna break it down, see if there's a kernel of truth maybe in some of these, and then set the record straight on all of them. This is episode 264 of The Drop Set. Let's hit it. Thank you all for joining me, episode 264 of The Drop Set here today for all those listening in audio land. Thank you and welcome to all of you and to those watching on YouTube, hi and thanks for joining me here. You can check out my kick-ass uh, bikini blueprint white hoodie here, pretty cool. Pretty snazzy. Um, you can always check out 5starphysique.com, 5stardigital.com for news and notes on everything that I am doing. Also, I would love it if you would check out thedropset.com. I have a new poll posted there today that I would love to get your take on. So the question is this. How would you rate your overall fitness knowledge? I give you five choices ranging from total noob to expert. It would help me in figuring out like who's actually watching or listening to this. So once again, if you just head to thedropset.com, scroll down a tiny little bit, you'll see the poll posted there. Go ahead and make your voice heard, please. So I have, uh, I got a whole bunch of fitness related myths and we're just gonna jump into them here. Uh, this will not be a raw reaction. I would love to do that where somebody just throws these things at me and I can, I can, uh, expand on them, but alas, uh, I don't have a producer to do that for me, so I have to do it myself. So therefore, I have read these briefly. I haven't really thought about them too much, but we're going to do just a quick little off-the-cuff response to all of these and try and set the record straight because all of these myths, they come from some kernel of truth some point where, well, part of this is true or it might be, you know, in some ways relevant. So I want to break that down a little bit as well. So Let's uh, let's dig in here. Let's not uh, not waste any more time. So these come from I think I just googled for a list of fitness myths, and this list came from I believe Noom.com, the uh, workout uh, the sorry the f nutrition tracking app that uh, in my breakdown previously when we looked at all those was one that I put in the also ran category, um, not really viable for what we want to do here. So number one on the list is this number on the scale is all that matters. True or false? Well, of course, I mean, when you make absolute statements like that, um, of course it's false. Um, nothing, regardless of what it is, is going to be all that matters. So it's just stupid on its face. And when you make an absolute statement like that, of course, it's you're, if this is a true false test, the way that you word the question will make the answer very obvious, right? So um, it's all that matters. No. Is it something that matters? Yeah. And in most cases, it matters a good bit. Like in most cases, and I know a lot of people will comment like, I did this, that. Yeah, I get it. But in most cases, I can tell you from somebody who sees hundreds and thousands of weight distribution patterns from people. In most cases, it tells you the answer. If, if the scale isn't moving, nothing's really happening. If it is, something's happening. Now, it's up to you to then determine whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that's happening, and all the other variables of your program will go into that. So is it all that matters? No. Does it matter to some extent? In most cases, yes. Again, not in all cases. Myth number two, not everyone should lift weights because it will make them bulky. I mean, th this is... One of those myths that I, I think I've talked about this before, and I, I after that, <laughs> might have been back in like episode three or something when I talked about this. Uh, and I said, well, I probably never need to talk about that again. But unfortunately, like every day, I encounter it still. People who think, who, people who are scared of lifting because they think it's going to make it make them bulky. If only it were that easy, people. Jesus H. Christ, if only it were that easy. I wish, so many of us wish, that it's just not a warranted fear on planet earth <laughs> like yeah you will gain a little bit of muscle if you haven't been lifting and you go and you attack the weights well and aggressively from the beginning with good form and good technique you'll gain some muscle not enough to make you bulky and eventually that's going to plateau and then you might be wanting more and more will not come so um this is often heard from people who just have have a good bit of body fat to lose as well. Like, I don't want to get my legs any bigger. I'm like, well, no, but you want more muscle on your legs. And then you're just carrying a bunch of body fat there. And if you strip that away, you would see that your legs aren't as big as you think they are. So um, myth number three, doing a lot of crunches will get you a flat stomach. 
And again, uh, I apologize. Like I might hurt some feelings here with some of this stuff. That is not my intention. But if I roll my eyes at some of these things, it's not because like, God, how stupid can you be to believe that? But it's more like, God, I hear this so much. Oh my God. And I'm so sick of hearing this stuff. Um, but I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Like, Hey, this area sucks, right? This area on my body sucks. So let me just work it directly and make it suck a little bit less. It would be nice if that were true. It's wishful thinking. And of course it's not, not reality at all. So a flat stomach, first of all, uh, I don't hear that verbiage a lot. What I hear is six pack more than anything else. Same difference for the most part. It's just a leaner abdominal area, um, which means body fat reduction in the midsection. Doing crunches does not impact body fat in that area. It will build up your abdominal muscles more, but it doesn't reveal them in any meaningful way. So you need body fat reduction. And the take home point here is that body fat is not owned by the muscle closest to it. So working that muscle does nothing for that body fat in that particular area. So um, you can dispel yourself of that notion right now. Uh, myth number four, to exercise, you have to join a gym. Have to? No, I mean, I'm pretty sure from the dawn of time that people have ran and running is exercise. And I'm pretty sure, hold on, last time I checked, I think... I might be wrong here, but I think you can run without a gym membership. Somebody's going to have to fact check me on that. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I'm pretty sure. I think I might have done it myself at one point. Um, in all honesty, it would have been years ago. <laughs> uh, of course, this is stupid. Now, to lift out, do you have to join a gym? Well, no. Um, you know, home gyms have always been prevalent, more so now. Um, you know, your typical home gym 15 or 20 years ago was a piece of shit that was probably barely functional. These days, plenty of people have, you know, reasonably functional home gyms. I would still make the argument that most people will do better um, going to a commercial facility than working out at home. They have access to better equipment, greater diversity and range of equipment, and also typically fewer distractions, sometimes more distractions if you're a jabber jaw. Uh, but working out at home, you're not leaving any place, and so therefore, whatever you would typically be leaving behind when you go to the gym is still always there. So like if you work from home, your work is still always there. Your kids are still there, etc. So all the trappings of home are still there. So the distraction potential training at home is super high. A lot of people make it work. Um, in a vacuum, I would say I do not do well training at home. Like post-COVID, I had the home gym set up. I hated it. I hated everything about it. Um, I hated the fact that it was in my garage, which was not air conditioned. So I'm like losing my grip on things just because my hands are sweating too much. Like that alone was enough to make me not want to have anything to do with it. There's plenty more beyond that too. Um, number five, extreme calorie cutting is a good way to lose weight. Well, it is a way to lose weight. Um, and it depends on, of course, how you define extreme. And also like what your arbiter is of, you know, good. <laughs> How do you want to define good? Uh, some people might say anything more than a 500 calorie deficit is extreme, to which I say you all need to get out a little bit more and expose yourself to a little bit more, uh, a wider range of, of dieting philosophies and principles. Um, it can get a lot more extreme than that. That is not extreme. Um, it, it might be, you know, moderately aggressive. It is not extreme. Uh, moderately aggressive calorie cutting, is that a good way to lose weight? For most people, it is. Um, absolutely. But it depends. You know, that number is going to be different for everybody. So um, I would say calorie cutting is a good way to lose weight. It is the only way to lose weight. It is the essential thing that's, that's a part of losing weight. Um, I would also say, like, we're not trying to lose weight. That, that's where I have the biggest issue with this question, actually. We're trying to lose body fat, which is different than losing weight. You can cut off a foot and lose weight. It's not necessarily the kind of weight that you want to lose. Um, also, you could drop muscle. You know, Just because the scale is moving down, this goes back to the first thing here, just because the scale is moving down doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. You've got to look at the rate of loss and consider that in with all the other factors, too. Uh, myth number six, you need electrolytes after every workout. I mean, that is not one that I've heard before. I guess, you know, the people who make Gatorade would probably be pushing that. Um, no, 
of course not. Um, like what might you need? You might need a little bit of sodium, but you know, the thing is after you work out, you're going to have a post-workout meal. That meal is probably going to have some sodium in it, regardless of what it is. And that's probably enough. Um, the idea that you need to replenish more aggressively with the one electrolyte that you would have lost in any significant way during your workout is kind of silly. Like we get plenty of sodium throughout the average day. So, um, the only thing I would say there is for people who uh, closely regulate and monitor their sodium intake and keep it low, just don't do that and you won't have a problem. If, if that's you, then yeah, you might need to supplement with some electrolytes, but just because you're intentionally going lower on them, at which point if you supplement with them, what's the point? So that's kind of a, kind of a head scratcher for me. Um, myth number seven, you can run off the pounds. You absolutely can run off some pounds. I don't know what the pounds are specifically, but um, yeah, I mean, a, a caloric deficit is what what has what will help you lose the pounds again, whatever that means. Um, th- by the way, these myths are provided with no context, so I don't know what exactly they're talking about, what the pounds in question might be. Uh, but yeah, uh, cardio will get rid of some pounds um, in addition to a caloric deficit. Now. Can you run and only run and do nothing else differently and lose the pounds? Well, it depends on what the rest of your do, what the rest of what you're doing is. If you eat like a jackass and just uh, are in a caloric surplus, no, you can't run off those pounds. So you can't do just that. But um, again, I think this is kind of a uh, uh, fallacy of a question. It's it's assuming like the most extreme. Um, situation here and saying, well, that doesn't work. I'm like, of course it doesn't. You know, none of the most extreme things that you can possibly think of are going to work probably. Um, Myth number nine. No, no, eight. Sorry, we skipped eight. Eight's super critical. You can eat whatever you want as long as you exercise. Does anybody actually fucking think that? Like, I don't know. I mean, maybe people do. Go vote in the poll. If you're a total noob, maybe you think that. And if so, hey, no shame on you. Um, But I don't hear from those people. I don't think those people listen to this podcast. Like, I think most people who are listening to this, who are watching me right now, know that, you know, also, let, let's, let's just take this myth at face value. You can eat whatever you want as long as you exercise. And what, not die? Yeah, probably. That's probably true. Um, you can eat whatever you want as long as you exercise. If you're trying to drop body fat, probably less so. Um, but, like, you're not going to get sent to jail, you're not going to die if you eat whatever you want and exercise. So in some way, it's like, to what end? I don't know. Myth number nine, let's just move on. Uh, number nine, you should do fat burning zone exercises to lose weight. So the fat burning zone is not a thing. The fat burning zone in and of itself is a myth. That is a non, uh, non-starter for me. Um, a lot of cardio equipment still comes pre-built with the little heart rate chart that shows like the green zone, which is where your fat burning zone is. It's like, it just, you know, just burn calories. You know, you need a calorie deficit to burn body fat. Um, there is no zone where it's more optimal. There is a zone where some certain level of intensity might be more sustainable for a longer period of time. And so therefore, if you run the numbers and spend more of your time in that range, that it might be more productive in the long term. But it's, there's nothing magical about being in that range. It's, it has more to do with, um, what's the word? Uh continuity, longevity, like you can sustain that deficit for longer just because, you know, if you're going really, really easy, right? You're not really burning a whole lot of calories. You're burning some, it's not zero, but you're going to have to do it for a long time to match a burn that you would have if you were going, you know, a good bit harder, but you could go for less time. And then if you went for hit cardio, you could go for less time still, but you have to work really, really hard and at a level where most people are not capable of sustaining that level of intensity for more than a few minutes. Um, so therefore your area under the curve, that's what it really comes down to is if you're in that fat burning zone, your area under the curve, as far as calories burned per minute and total number of minutes is going to be greater. And so, uh, but there's nothing magical about that zone. That's just where your endurance and your calorie bone, calorie burn um, per minute tend to be in kind of a sweet spot. Um, myth number 10, stretching prevents injuries. Uh, I would not say that's a myth at all. It depends on what injury. Um, it's not going to prevent an injury if you get in a car crash, but if you injure yourself in the gym on uh, performing an exercise where your mobility is limited because, 
uh, you have poor range of motion because you have muscles that are overly tight and not moving well, 100% stretching will, um, will prevent injuries. Will it prevent all injuries? No. But certain types, yes. So if we're talking in absolutes again, if that's a true false statement, stretching prevents injuries. True. Um, at, at least at, in, in some ways. Absolutely. Number 11, fat can turn into muscle and muscle can turn into fat. Um, I'm pretty sure like, what was it? It was Middle Ages, like 1200 or so BC when we disproved transmutation of states of matter from one to the other or like a certain substance into another. Like you can't transmute lead into gold. Um, I think that's been disproven now for close to a thousand years. Um, muscle and fat, same thing. One cannot become the other. It should not be a myth, and anyone who's done second or third grade science should know that. Um, let's see, the number of, uh, myth number 12, the number of calories your cardio machine says you burn is accurate. Of course it isn't. Um, if you plug in your height, weight, gender, and age, um, it will um, factor that in and still give you a number that is based on a lot of assumptions. Um, just based on tables, it will you know, put you into a formula and say, here's how many calories we think you're burning. That number is not going to be accurate. If you have a wearable that tells you how many calories you're burning, that number is not accurate either. And you're wearing that, like it's measuring your data. It's still making a lot of guesses on things. So none of those things are accurate. Um, but what I would say, uh, the corollary to that is if you, um, if you consistently measure your caloric output in the same way. Like I always get on the same elliptical machine. I don't plug in any of my details and I always go on level seven and I go for 30 minutes. And after that, the machine says I burn 220 calories. Now that 220 number is wrong, but if you get on it the next day and do all the same stuff and it says you burn 240 calories, it means you pushed about 20 calories harder than you did the previous day. The next day, if you push 190, it means you pulled back a little bit. You didn't burn as many. So the numbers are correct in relative terms, like if it's higher or lower one day versus the next, but just not in absolute terms. I would say that's true of anything that reports a caloric, uh, a caloric uh, expenditure. So, um, But it's more useful if the activities are the same. So if you're on the same piece of cardio equipment, et cetera, um, you can make a lot more inferences that way. Uh, n- myth number 13, workouts should be at least an hour. I mean... No. Um, how do we define workout as well? Like for me, that's training, that's lifting. Um, should that be at least an hour? No, I'd say an hour is a sweet spot for most people. That's fair. Um, I've had many workouts that are a lot less than that. Many that were a lot longer than that. So um, no, at least an hour? No, no, dumb. Uh, myth number 14, you should do your cardio first. Now, who, who says you should do your cardio first? That's my question. Who is dispensing that advice? A lot of people think that they should, but they think that they should because they don't know any better. I don't know if there's any article anywhere that says that. Primary reason for this. So do your cardio first means to me, do your cardio before you lift. Um, like if you are getting in your, in your car and driving to the gym, um, once you get there, do you do your cardio first or do you lift first? And ideally, I would say before you hopped in your little Honda Civic and drove to the gym, you probably scarfed down a pre-workout meal. That pre-workout meal is designed to fuel your training session, your lifting, not your cardio. So ergo, when you get to the gym, you want to use the calories from that pre-workout meal, the energy that you get from that to fuel a lift. And I would say if you're hitting multiple muscle groups, you would also want to favor the muscle groups that need more attention or require more energy first so that they get more of that immediate energy from whatever you just took in. And then cardio can be done uh, once that energy has been depleted on something approaching an empty stomach. Totally cool there. Uh, let's see. 15, lifting doesn't help you with weight loss. Of course it does. So... Um, this is one I won't roll my eyes on this, even though I, I constantly surprise people with this fact all the time. So the more muscle you have, the higher your metabolic rate, the higher your metabolic rate, the more calories you burn doing nothing. That, that's the most powerful thing that you can do for fat loss is burn more calories at rest. Um, basically, the more calories you can burn doing little or nothing, the better off you'll be. So a higher metabolic rate and then just a higher activity level, um, like more steps in a day is going to be more powerful for fat loss than any amount of cardio, any amount of lifting, anything like that. Those things are all still good. Um, and you'll probably need some of that in order to have a really good um, outcome in a fat loss phase, but just having a higher metabolic rate, 
more muscle on your frame, um, and just being more active, those are the things that are really going to move and, and drive results. Number 16, bigger muscles translate into greater strength. Um, I would say that is probably actually true. Um, the bigger a muscle is, the stronger it is relative to that same muscle at a smaller size. Like your output has increased. Now, whether you train in such a way that helps you realize that increase in output is another thing. And what I specialize in is the opposite of that. So um, I would say a lot of people aren't necessarily going to realize those, those strength increases, but they are there to be found and discovered if you train in such a way that will help you find and discover them. Um, but yeah, so greater strength. So I'm assuming we're comparing here like you on day one versus you on day 100. If you have a bigger muscle wherever on day 100 than you did on day one, then the output of that muscle is going to be greater as well, which means greater strength. So yeah, that is not a myth. That is a fact. Um, but again, there can be some issues with realization of said fact based on your training style. Um, number 17, spot training can help you lose fat in a specific area of your body. We already covered that with, uh, which was it here? Uh, myth number three, doing a lot of crunches will get you a flat stomach. Again, body fat tissue is not owned by the muscle around it. So you can't spot train anything. Uh, I mean, you can spot train muscles, um, but you can't spot train fat. Uh, myth number 18, the more you sweat, the more fat you'll burn. No, the more you sweat, the, the hotter your body is. And there is, there are a lot of things that can make you hot that have nothing to do with burning calories, which again, burning fat is about burning calories. If you live in Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and you're here in August, just go stand outside for five minutes, check your pulse, check your heart rate, and then check how many buckets of sweat you've dripped off just from the humidity of being outside in the fucking South in August. Um, like that is not, that, that is water loss. That is not fat loss. You see a lot of people who will layer up in multiple layers of clothing. They wear a trash bag when they're doing their cardio or whatever. I want to sweat more. Like, great, sweat more. That's fine. Um, but, you know, body you can't wipe body fat off your skin. Like, that's not what sweat is. So don't kid yourself into thinking that that's more productive. Keep yourself rooted in fact, please. Sweating is, is I mean, if you work really hard, you will also sweat. But sweating alone doesn't mean anything. doesn't mean jack shit. It just means your body's hot. That's it. Uh, where are we at here? Myth number 19. If you take a break from working out, your muscles will turn to fat. Once again, transmutation of substances is not a thing. Myth number 20. Carbs are evil. Um, yeah, carbs killed my dog, man. I mean, if you're allergic to carbs, carbs they can be evil. But those would be specific carbs, not all of them, probably. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a myth because, you know, the 1980s were very, very formative in a lot of people's uh, lives. Um, that's when we learned a lot of information, learned a lot of information growing up. And unfortunately, these things won't die. And so a lot of people are still going off knowledge that they learned in the 1980s. And in the 80s, carbs were the worst. Um, this is why Atkins came about, ketogenic diets, because carbs are evil. The thought being, you know, look, I'm going to stop eating carbs. And in a week, I'll drop seven pounds. It's fluids because carbs make your body retain fluids. Carbs are also great for performance. So you take those out. In most cases, you'll find that your performance kind of tanks a little bit. So, um, yeah, so it, no, it's this kind of goes back to the first one here, which was um, specifically the number on the scale is all that matters. Again, that number requires interpretation. Um, if you go from eating a carb-heavy diet and then you go keto, you're going to drop five, six, seven, eight pounds in a week or less. You're not dropping body fat at that rate. It's fluids, and you're dropping those fluids because your carb intake went, went way down. Your glycogen stores are depleted. That's it. Um, 21, exercising will suppress immune system function. Do people think that? I don't remember hearing that like when COVID um, mania was at its peak. Um, it was quite the opposite. Like there was quite a push to get gyms to open back up so that people could work out and be healthier, which, you know, let's be clear, it doesn't really help your immune system either. And being around a bunch of people when there is a, cont a highly contagious infectious disease isn't necessarily the most brilliant thing in the world either. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, it's not going to um, suppress your immune system function. I would say, you know, the, the corollary to that is if you're already sick, 
um, your immune system is already working hard and it's, it's fighting for resources. And so working out when you're sick um, is going to deprive your immune system of resources that it might need to help you get over whatever it is it's trying to fight. So you're not going to get sick from working out, but you may delay your recovery a little bit if you work out while you're sick. Uh, 22, some people just don't see improvements from exercise. That's a myth. <laughs> That's not a myth. That's hundred percent true. That is an immutable truth. Some people don't see improvements from exercise because they're not doing it well. Like you can't just go in like, you know, it's like if I was to grab a guitar off this wall and pick it up and just start, you know, doing whatever with it, um, be like, well, you know, <laughs> some people just don't see improvements from playing guitar. Like, yeah, of course, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing with it. I mean, I, I could pretend to, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, nobody's going to confuse me for being, you know, Guthrie Govan or anything like that. So, uh, no, I mean, you got to put in the work. It has to be work that's well done, um, at least as far as training is concerned. Uh, most people don't see improvements from exercise. If we count that as being cardio, cardio is something that requires a lot less skill. Like you just go and you have to push yourself a little bit. That's all there is to it. Lifting requires a lot more skill. And as such, the skill needs to be practiced to be able to see the outcome that you want from that. That skill has to be developed through practice as well. So um, part of that is true. If we we're talking just about cardio, I'd be like, no, if you're not seeing results from cardio, it's just because you're not trying and maybe you should just try a little harder. Uh, myth number 23, a person cannot exercise if he or she hasn't eaten. Again, does anybody believe this shit? I mean, <laughs> why? If this is a myth, I'm assuming it means that somebody believes this. Has anybody ever said out loud, I can't exercise because I haven't eaten anything? Like, of course you can. Like, you might, your performance might be terrible. You might suck ass and not hit any PRs and not be, uh, you know, setting your logbook on fire or anything like that, but cannot exercise? Like there's a, an invisible force field barrier at the door to the gym and you can't go in if you haven't eaten a pre-workout meal. Like, give me a fucking break. And come on, let's, let's get smarter here, people. Uh, pre-work, pre-workout products are just hype and commercialism. Is that a myth? I don't know. I think, uh, I think a good bit of that is probably true. Um, pre-workout products are not, um, going to do for you what many other things can do. I made the point on here sometime back, um, people ask about creatine and should they get anything out of it? And I always encourage people to get their, um, get their priorities straight. And if you aren't logging your workouts, you will get more from doing that than you would from 10 years worth of creatine use. So pick things off in the pecking order. Um, if you're not logging your workouts, the same thing, a pre-workout product, you know, you'd be all hopped up on caffeine and feel like you're on Coke, but it's not going to do anything for you beyond what many other basic things can do for you. So you can get by without pre-workout very easily. Uh, they're just hype and commercialism. No, but they're a lot of hype and commercialism. Let's be clear on that. Myth number 25, what you eat after a workout doesn't matter. <laughs> Again, it doesn't, or you can, who thinks this? Um, now, a lot of people will think, um, you know, you can post-workout eat kind of whatever you want, and it can be like junky stuff or whatever just because your body will use it. And that, that is true to some extent. There are limits to that, of course. Like, it, you still have to think of like the basic caloric needs of your body and how that compares to what you're putting into it. So if your typical pre-workout meal would be four or post-workout meal would be 400 calories and you decide you're going to have a 2000 calorie burger and fries, like, yeah, going five times over your intake, um, that matters. That's going to leave a mark. You're going to have to clean that up. Um, so yeah, it matters. Um, but food selection matters a little bit less. You can get away with a little bit more post-workout. Um, myth number 26, <laughs> endurance exercise isn't safe. Where does this stuff come from? Like, are they talking about endurance exercise? Like, like CrossFit and we're afraid of rhabdo or something like that. Maybe uh, otherwise, how isn't endurance exercise safe? I would say personal opinion here is kind of dumb. I don't like it. Unsafe. No, give me a break. Uh, myth number 27, pregnant women shouldn't exercise. Kind of silly. Again, I think most doctors, um, even those not well-versed in exercise would say, yeah, absolutely. You should exercise possibly with some modifications. Depends on how pregnant you are as well. It depends on your experience level. Have you been exercising regularly and following some kind of a plan prior to getting pregnant? If so, you might not need to change anything that you're doing at all, not even restricting certain movements or positions for the first six months of pregnancy, possibly. So um, 
Yeah, <laughs> pregnant women shouldn't exercise. You know, if, if you are in a high risk pregnancy situation and you have not been exercising before, I would be very cautious about what kind of exercise program you would start up at this point. Um, and that's something that you should discuss with a doctor. So there are some caveats to that. Absolutely. Um, weight loss supplements are good enough to lose weight. Good enough, meaning like by themselves. Yeah, if that were true, then um, Dr. Oz would be president of the United States. Um, that's it. I mean, he did run for Senate, but he didn't win. Um, so it, that guy sells bullshit for a living. And if it worked, everybody would buy it, and he would be heralded as a genius instead of a borderline moronic talk show host who happens to have a medical degree somehow. Um, no, no, of course not. Of course not. Myth number 29, you shouldn't consume carbs before a workout. Again, who says these things? That's when you would want to. That and after, those are the times when you really, really want to. If you're only going to consume carbs at two points during the day or at one point during the day, pre-workout is a good candidate for one of those times. Post-workout would be the other. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You want to have enough gas in the tank to fuel a good workout, 100%. Um, walking 10,000 steps is enough to lose weight. You know, for some people it is, um, that is not a myth that could be true situationally. If you are somebody who is chronically inactive, um, and you are largely maintaining weight with what you're doing right now, which is nothing. And then you start taking 10,000 steps per day, you will almost certainly lose weight. It's that easy. Like you're, you're increasing your expenditure. Whereas you were maintaining before, now you're going to be at a deficit. Yes, that is how weight loss happens. That is not a myth. Um, that is, I would say, completely true in certain circumstances. Um, you shouldn't engage in sexual activity before workouts. Well, if you're talking about like I'm like the car ride to the gym or something, maybe not for safety purposes. Otherwise, like what would the theory be for this? Um, I've I've heard it expressed before that some people have thoughts where. If you, um, if you abstain from sexual activity, um, especially for men, like your testosterone level increases, you get more aggressive. I'm like, that's not really, there's nothing to back that up at all. I would say if you engage in vigorous sexual activity right before working out, I wouldn't do that simply because you're wearing yourself out right before you're going to have to go and work hard. And it's just logically, I think we can all agree that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, 32, you should only work out during the morning hours. Again, where the fuck? Do they... <sighs> Guys, it, it's moments like this where it kind of comes, comes at me in a wave where I just like, I just copy and pasted this question list in. So I, I scanned a few of them. I didn't read them all. I didn't see that one until just now. And now I'm, I'm in this position now where I'm like, this is what I'm up against. So in some ways, it's like, hey, there will always be value in me making YouTube videos and putting things out online. Um, just because no matter how much stuff I say, there will always be people who think stuff like this. And part of me just makes me so despondent for humanity as well. Like, why do I bother? Uh, you should only work out during the morning hours. Huh? Like what, you turn into a fucking werewolf at 6 p.m. and you don't want to be in the gym when you start, you know, sprouting body hair all over? Like, whatever, let's just move on. Uh, myth number 33, to get large muscles, you have to lift a lot of weight. Um, well, I mean, it depends on how you want to break down the construction of that sentence. Um, you have to lift a lot of weight, meaning like, a lot of pounds over time, yeah. Like over the course of many years, you will have to lift a lot of weight in order to build quote unquote large muscles. So yeah, um, now I think what they're saying here is in order to grow a muscle, you have to lift heavy. And, and that I would say like is also true if we add in one word, which is relatively. Relative to what you've done in the past, you will have to live heavier than, you'll have to lift heavier than that to grow long-term. That's the fundamental principle of progressive overload. That's science, bitches. So, yeah, there's, that's a fact. Um, now, the idea that you have to go, as, you have to, like, set world records on lifts in order to build muscle, no, I'm not, I don't think that's what they're getting at here. Maybe it is. In that case, I would agree and say, no, that's a myth. Oh, my God. 
I need a. I need a mental detox break. I need to watch an episode of SpongeBob or something like that. I've never even watched SpongeBob. I don't even know what that would do for me. Um, is that the kind of thing where like you get high and watch SpongeBob? Is that what you do? Is that a thing? Seems like it. The only thing I know about SpongeBob are what I've seen from him appearing in memes. And so I get kind of a very, very vague sense of what he's about and what that show is about from that. Seems like the kind of thing where being high would really help. I don't know. Coming from a guy who, sadly, I say sadly, not like I have a regret, but it's kind of like it shows a lack of life experience here. I've never been high, so um, I can't I can't speak to anything that I'm talking about here right now. Whew. All right, quick break here. I just wanted to remind everybody, check out 5starphysique.com. You can read about everything that I do there as far as coaching, have workout programs available, some merch, etc., all kinds of cool stuff. You can also check out 5stardigital.com where I have all of my online courses available. Right now, I'm working on Bikini Blueprint, Hypertrophy University, Macro Boot Camp, Men's Physique Blueprint, all kinds of stuff going on there. Those courses are going to start to become available June 1st of this year. I'm working my tail off getting those things ready for prime time. You can actually go there right now, pre-order those courses if you want, or hit me up through Five Star Physique with any questions that you have on any of those courses. I'd be more than happy to help you out. Uh, okay, so I, I have for you a bonus thing here, a bonus thing on bodybuilding myths specifically. Now, there are not 33 of these. There are only 10 of these. So um, some of these, there may be some crossover. These I have not read. I just saw this list. I'm like, cool, blind, copy, paste, cool. So I haven't read these except for the first one. Um, all bodybuilders are on steroids. All? Most? Could be something to that. Many? Sure. Absolutely. All? Give me a break. Again, it's the absolute statement here that makes it dumb as shit. <laughs> as soon as you say, this happens all the time. Everyone does this. This never happens. Like, of course, all that's false. Um, number two, there are shortcuts to getting ripped. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, shortcuts, it, that's the thing. A shortcut doesn't mean you don't work. A shortcut just means it makes it easier. So taking clenbuterol and T3 absolutely makes it easier, 100%. Yes, 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 yes. Having a higher metabolic rate because you have more muscle on your frame due to taking anabolic steroids, also, yes, true. Um, that is a shortcut. It does not mean it does not work still. So there are shortcuts to getting ripped, absolutely. They aren't going to do the work for you. It's not that kind of a shortcut. Number three, you must work out every single day to achieve a bodybuilder's physique. Now that I know a lot of people believe in because you would not believe the amount of energy that I expend on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis getting clients to take days off. Um, so yeah, no, you don't have to. And I would say um, getting the best physique that you could possibly have, um, you can't do that while training every single day. Um, unless you just train like shit, like your intensity sucks, in which case... Yeah, you don't really need um, recovery time if your training intensity sucks. But also, if your training intensity sucks, you're not going to build your best physique. So, yes, you need to work hard and you need to take rest. Number four, you have to give up all the pleasures in life to get the body you want. Well, no, but situationally you do. Yeah. And also, all the pleasures in life. Like, I'm pretty sure that even on prep, you can still have sex, pet a dog, smell flowers, take a walk on the beach. You can do all those things in prep. So um, all the pleasures in life, what they're saying here is that if you derive all of your pleasure in life from food, you have to give all that up to get the body you want. And I would challenge that as well. I'm like, no, it's just what you get enjoyment out of has to change a little bit. And, you know, as we've talked about here many, many times, um, the way that you prep your meals, the way you plan your meals can have a tremendous impact on that. Uh, bodybuilding and powerlifting will ruin a woman's feminine physique. Well, this assumes that a woman has a feminine physique to begin with. Don't cancel me here, but you know, depending on how we define feminine, um, a lot of women just don't have a feminine shape to begin with. A lot of men do. So ruin a woman's feminine physique, let's just set that piece of the 
the myth aside really quick. Bodybuilding and powerlifting will ruin it. No, um, there are characters of what both of those look like. You know, bodybuilding, um, what it will do. Really, what you're looking about, looking at there is like heavy androgen use will like change facial features, etc. Um, maybe you know get somebody to build a physique that is bigger than what's considered feminine. A lot of people would argue that that has nothing to do with what a feminine physique really is, and that you can be extremely muscular and still have a feminine physique. Um, just like you can be relatively small small and still have what some people would consider a very masculine physique as well. You know, that doesn't necessarily change it. And then if you look at the character of a power lifter, where you've just got somebody who's kind of like shaped like a refrigerator, um, that is a character also. Like that is not common. I would say most power lifters look like relatively normal people who appear to be pretty strong. And there's nothing I would say not feminine about appearing strong. So um, now if by feminine you mean what's going to be on the cover of Cosmopolitan magazine, I would say correct, it will ruin that kind of a physique. I would say that's probably not what most people are chasing, especially if they're listening to something like this. I'd also say that's not really attainable for most people um, just because that is something that's built more around bone structure and frame size than anything else. So... Um, Anyway, number six, the goal is just to get huge. Well, it needs to be first. <laughs> I mean, huge for whatever category you want to be in. Without the size, your condition doesn't matter. You're always going to be undersized. So um, huge relatively, meaning if you step on stage at 135 pounds, setting a goal to step on stage at 142 pounds with the same level of conditioning, relatively, that's huge. That's huge. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't be chasing 190 pounds stage lean. You know, you're not going to get 55 pounds of muscle put on that frame more than likely. And you probably wouldn't want to in that case. So huge relative for your frame size. Yeah, absolutely. Stretching will hurt your gains. Again, what is it with the stretching myths here? Stretching will hurt your gains. Stretching improves your gains. Give me a break. Um, you, eight, you've got to get that muscle pump, they put in quotes, which makes me wonder, like, what website did I get this from? Muscle pump. Um, you've got to get that. Uh, no, you can get a good workout without that, for sure. It's kind of like soreness, though. It, it is a good leading indicator of whether or not you're doing the right thing. Um, like, I've worked with people who say, like, I just never feel a pump. Like, I don't even know what that's supposed to feel like. To which I say, okay, we have issues. Because if you don't know what that feels like, you're probably not working out effectively. Now, just because you do get a pump doesn't mean that you're doing everything right. Um, but it's a good start. It's a good step one, for sure. Uh, number nine, you must always train to failure. No, but you need to know where that failure point is. You need to know what that feels like so then you can know if you're one or two or three or four reps away from failure. Um, so you must always train to? No, but you need to be well-versed in where that is. And then number 10, the last one. The heavier, the better. No, no, that one I will agree is totally a myth. Um, I would say, I might change that one up and do it a little bit differently. I would say, the heavier you can make something light feel, the better. Like, if you can really challenge yourself with a relatively low weight and really pack a lot of tension into the muscle that you're trying to target with a, a fairly, you know, minuscule weight, you know, Clearly, like if you can, if you're capable of benching 315, you're not going to find challenge in putting 85 pounds on the bar and, and repping out. Like that's not useful. But just because you can push 315 doesn't mean there's no value in doing 225 or 245 for really, really good controlled reps. Make that lighter weight feel more like 315. If you can do that, that's that's a good spot to be. Very good spot to be. So. That's the end of the list. 43 myths later, we have busted them. God, I need a drink. Oh, my God. Thank you all for joining me here. I appreciate it. Um, vote in the poll. Thedropset.com. Go vote in the poll and help me kind of flesh out my knowledge of who's listening to and watching this podcast, just because that will help me tailor some things going forward. Um, this I would consider to be something a little bit more beginner centric. And if everybody says they're more advanced, that tells me like, hey, less of this stuff. Let's get deeper into the weeds on some things too. So um, also fivestarphysique.com. 5starddigital.com, the former, you can read all about my coaching programs, workout programs, the latter, you can check out my online courses such as Bikini Blueprint, Hypertrophy University, Macro Bootcamp, 
et cetera. You can check me out personally on Instagram at Darren underscore star. You can check out the show on Instagram at the drop set podcast. So that's all I've got folks. I appreciate you joining me here. We'll be back next week for episode 265. Once again, wherever you listen, um, kindly rate the show. If you can, if you're on YouTube, leave a comment, like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell. If you want more, if you're listening on Apple podcasts, please leave a star rating and a review. We're almost close to a hundred ratings now, which, you know, I've been doing this for eight years. So that's a pretty small number. And that's one of the things that really helps people find the show. The more ratings it has, the more comments it has, uh, the more uh, it will turn up in people's searches. So help me out, please. I'd be forever thankful. So that's all I got. Enough groveling for me. I will catch you all next week. Peace out. Okay, that wraps up another episode. And thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and tag me on Instagram. I am at Darren underscore star. Also, please subscribe to the channel here if you haven't already. And feel free to check out any of those other videos that you see here as well. FiveStarPhysique.com has details on everything that I have to offer, including contest prep coaching, body transformation coaching, workout programs, swag, and a whole lot more. Thanks again for listening. And I will catch you all back here next week.